50 billion devices connected by 2030. 180 zettabytes created by 2025. More than 7,700 satellites currently in Earth's orbit. What can we do? We build open source software to solve infrastructure problems. We create diverse, inclusive, sustainable communities. We meet locally, regionally, globally. We collaborate without boundaries. We're open infra. Thousands of deployments across every industry. More than 10,000 individual contributors with 650,000 changes across 65 countries. 700 supporting organizations. 110,000 individuals across 187 countries. With one mission, build the next decade of open infrastructure. And welcome to our 22nd summit. We've brought the summit all over the world. So from uh, Austin to Paris, to Tokyo, to Sydney, to San Diego, Vancouver, Shanghai. And it's always been a, a pleasure for me to meet you all at all of those events around the world, to see, so attend so many interesting talks, to have so many interesting discussions, and, uh, and just collaborate to make the software better. Like Alison said, about half of the audience, for, for about half of the, half, of the, half of the audience, it's your first Open, open Infra Summit. And so you may not know that this is our third time in Vancouver. We had um, a summit in Vancouver in 2015, and back then it was all still called the OpenStack Summit. And since then, we have expanded our mission and we have renamed uh, the summit to Open Infra Summit. We have renamed the foundation to Open Infra Foundation. Open Infra is short for Open Infrastructure. So what do we mean by Open Infrastructure? Well, let's break it down. First, let's look at Open. Open is, means open source, first and foremost. But beyond the licensing, it also means openly developed openly designed, and openly governed. And those four open principles are essential to creating healthy, sustainable communities, which is key to producing long-lasting infrastructure software. Next is the word infrastructure. With our experience in OpenStack, we realized two things. That it was serving a new population of operators of infrastructure that are interested in using open source solutions for providing infrastructure. It's really a new role that we are seeing emerging within organizations, within companies. And the second thing we realized is that this new population was interested in more than just OpenStack. In practice, open infrastructure sits between hardware and application servers for everyone to build and innovate on top of. This is a space that benefits a lot from commoditization and standardization. It's a space where we can openly collaborate on common solutions because there is a way to monetize and differentiate on top. And in reality, if you look at history, it's a relatively new idea. Back when we started this in 2010, open source was not the dominant force it is today. On the infrastructure side, there was basically one big proprietary player in the private infrastructure space. There was one big provider relying on a proprietary stack of services in the public, public space. And with that, you can imagine all the side effects like uh, monopolies, high prices, vendor lock-in, limited customization, etc. And we started our journey back in 2010 to create a better option. We wanted to build open source solutions for providing infrastructure and make those key technologies available to everyone. Our idea was to build something for anyone, to do anything, to use anywhere. We wanted to make sure that anyone could have access to those technologies. We wanted to make sure that they could use them to do anything without asking for permission. 
and that those solutions would be available anywhere to help distribute the future more evenly. And we started doing the, just that. We created OpenStack, um, which was the first open source cloud software with a universal focus being usable by anyone to do anything. But what OpenStack really created is a space to discuss open infrastructure. And this gave other projects like Ceph, like Open vSwitch, like KVM, a space to be discussed, to be integrated, to be exposed to the world. And they were soon joined by other projects. Uh, Kubernetes was created really with the same principles in mind. And we got Kata Containers and Zool and Starling X and all of those other projects. They're all targeted to the same audience. Infrastructure providers interested in using, developing, deploying open source solutions for providing infrastructure. It could be you know, in, with the goal of building a completely open source stack, but it's also with the goal of just using one open source piece in an otherwise, an otherwise proprietary stack. And this week at the Open Infra Summit, like Alison uh, said, we'll have all those communities getting together. Open Infra projects, but also Kubernetes, Alma Linux, Rocky Linux, um, CentOS, Ceph, and Ceph will actually have their Ceph days here on Thursday. So uh, please be sure to, uh, to check out Room 18 and uh, talk to the Ceph community more directly. All those communities share our goal to produce infrastructure software for anyone to do anything to use anywhere. So where are we today? I would say we have succeeded. Today, anyone is everyone. Anything is everything. And anywhere is everywhere. And I'll spend the rest of this keynote to actually explain what I mean by that. So first, anyone is everyone. This really talks to how we set out to reach potentially anyone. And we succeeded, and we ended up reaching out to a lot of people and being used on a lot of computers. We started with 150 community members uh, back at the inaugural Austin OpenStack Design Summit. And today, we have more than 110,000 community members all around the world. We started with a couple of organizations, Rackspace and NASA. And now we have more than 700 organizations involved in Open Infra. Looking at OpenStack, more specifically, OpenStack usage, uh, our latest user survey reports more than 40 million CPU cores of computing power being driven directly by OpenStack. That's not only a huge number, it's also really growing faster than ever. If we look at the contributor side, we went from dozens of contributors to thousands of contributors. And uh, Kendall will spend more time explaining these charts which were generated from, uh, from the Viterja dashboard that, that we'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll be announcing later. Anything is everything. This talks to how we set out to build tools to allow permissionless innovation that could be used for any use case. And we succeeded, and those tools ended up being used for everything. We started with two use cases, uh, Rackspace with the public cloud and NASA with the research cloud. And today, OpenStack and Open Infra software is used in gaming, in finance, in insurance, in telcos, all of those uh, areas and verticals of use cases that we're not, we were not designed specifically for uh, doing it uh, originally. Looking at Kata containers, more specifically, Kata Containers is securing container workloads at N Group, powering the largest payment processor in the world, Alipay, processing more than 100 million payments per day and being used by over a billion users. Kata Containers also available on Microsoft Azure Kubernetes service, powering confidential computing features there, which is really huge because it's the first hyperscale cloud to come out and say publicly that they are using Kata containers to secure their container workloads. And we'll talk more about that today during the keynotes. Open Infra has become so ubiquitous, you can actually spend your whole day powered by Open Infra software. 
can start the day playing some game powered by Blizzard and OpenStack. You can take out in your Volvo, and if you don't crash uh, your Volvo, it's probably because Zool has helped testing uh, the software that runs it. You can uh, pay with Alipay uh, some, something, your caf coffee at the coffee shop, and that's powered by Kata containers. And you can check out your friends using Verizon powered by Starling X. So today, Open Infra covers really everything, which really brings the question, where does Open Infra go tomorrow? There is clearly more space to explore between hardware and uh, application servers. For example, software to integrate new hardware features. Um, you, you, we could have more open source components in, used in proprietary public cloud stacks. We can go beyond addressing the everything of today and addressing the everything of tomorrow. We're really seeing new use cases that drive new, new requirements on infrastructure, and we need to meet those. In security and privacy, in artificial intelligence, in environmental sustainability, in uh, more hardware integration. And throughout the rest of those keynotes, we'll, uh, we'll go into a lot more details around distributed computing, confidential computing, and AI. Finally, anywhere is everywhere. This really talks to how we wanted to collaborate without boundaries and give access to those technologies anywhere, and not just in the very few countries around the world that can actually afford it. And we succeeded, and our community is now truly global. We are in over 182 countries, and that kind of reach is not possible without the passion and the coordination from individuals who rally their local communities together. And to talk more about that, uh, uh, welcome on stage Helena Spies, who will talk more about it. Helena. Thank you, Thierry. It's great to be here this week at the Open Infra Summit. As Thierry mentioned earlier, the infrastructure world used to be entirely proprietary, but the Open Infra Foundation revolutionized that. And where the open infra community especially shines is exactly in that, the community. So I would like you to join me in welcoming on the stage our community organizers. folks up here, but this is only a small portion of them, actually. There's over 50 meetup groups around the globe, and these people are the heart and soul of the Open Infra community. They provide means for collaboration regionally through meetups, Open Infra Days, and more. Within these 50 communities around the world, there's an organizer for each of those and often a coalition of co-organizers behind them. So that's so many organizers. <laughs> um, they, yeah, heart and soul of the community. And in addition to that, we often have people here in the audience too who provide means for venue space, sponsorships, speaking opportunities, and more, and provide to these meetups and open it for days. So I'm gonna hand it over to the heart and soul of the community to introduce themselves. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Li Haoyang, um, organizers from uh, Shanghai. Hello, I'm Adrian Kinin. I'm one of the organizers for the user groups in France uh, for the cities of Paris and Rennes. Hi, I'm Nils Magnus. I'm based in Berlin, Germany, in Europe. Jonathan Race, uh, based out of Augusta, Georgia, United States. Robert Holling, located in Lingen, Germany. Alan Cantrell, based out of Augusta, Georgia, United States. Hi, Ram. I'm Rico Ling, uh, based in New Taipei City, Taiwan. Hi, my name is Akihiro Hasegawa, from Tokyo, Japan. 
Hi, I'm Sash Ghosh, and I'm representing Los Angeles, California, United States. Hello, all. my name is Alvaro Soto, and I'm from Mexico City. Um, hello, I'm Sung Soo from OpenStack Korea User Group. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Ji Wai Kim. I'm a community organizer in Korea. Thank you. Charles Pike, Kentucky. Christian Yashevsky, Raleigh, North Carolina. Abhisak Shuya, Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, Andy Bodding, I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. I'm Kenneth Tan, I'm in Frankfurt, Germany. One more big round of applause for these folks. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. So if you want to hear more about the community and meet these folks in person, well, up close, you can meet them tomorrow at 4.30 or 4 p.m. Alvaro Soto will be giving a talk on the cultural challenges of open source in Latin America. Directly following that, we will have the Marketplace Mixer, where not only can you mingle with our sponsors, but you can also meet our organizers and talk about how you can collaborate regionally with them. Thank you. Elena, thanks to all the Open Friday organizers. They are really the local relays uh, for our community in all of those local, uh, local areas. So it's really uh, a very important part of our community. Their work really shows through all those Open Friday events, but also their contributions, uh, usage, and even foundation membership. So open source, and more specifically, Open Infra is truly global. But we are not guaranteed it will stay that way. We are not guaranteed another decade of collaboration without boundaries. Today, everywhere is at risk. We could see from the difficulties that a lot of you had to get visas traveling here, uh, that boundaries are a strong reality. And there are more and more geopolitical tensions, more and more ill-informed regulations that have the potential to destroy open source and open collaboration the way we know it. For example, the Cyber Resilience Act in Europe, which does not take into account the specificity of open source in the regulation, which may have chilling effects on future development. If we want to have another decade of open source, another decade of open innovation without boundaries, we need to take action. This is something we've been thinking about a lot, uh, for a long time, and today we're ready to take action. Today we are announcing Open Infra Europe and Open Infra Asia, two regional hubs of the Open Infra Foundation. We really reached critical mass of activity in Europe and Asia, and it's very important for us to be able to aggregate regional voices on how to best respond to regional challenges but also just generally strengthen the regional ecosystems and help coordinate local communities. In Europe, we need to place open infra front and center in the digital sovereignty debate, and also address more directly EU proposed legislation. And our members in, based in Europe, Ericsson and all the others, have answered to our call. In Asia, we have exceptionally strong local communities and markets that we need to enable at the regional level. And our members in Asia, including N Group and Huawei, have rallied around this objective. If you want to become a participant in either of those organizations, please go to those websites. Uh, members of the Open Infra Foundation can uh, get to participate in those regional hubs at the same level as their membership at no additional cost. We're excited to see how those new regional hubs help coordinate the community regionally and tackle those crucial challenges ahead of us and see how they help us ensure that Open Infra continues to be used by everyone, for everything, and everywhere. Thank you.
Thank you, Terry. That was great. Uh, exciting announcement. We're really excited about these regional hubs. Um, so one of the things that he mentioned uh, quickly with the Baturgia graphs is the, the growth and contributor uh, contributions. Uh, we have some sessions here that if you are a contributor, which I know a lot of you in this room are, you should definitely check out. Uh, the first one is tomorrow at 1140. It's a forum session that's discussing a new community blueprint initiative. Uh, and the second one is on Thursday, also at 1140. Uh, which is a panel about balancing, um, if you're an individual contributor, balancing organizational needs with uh, upstream contributions, both very interesting topics that you should, you should check out. Um, so up next, we are going to uh, move on to something called Loki, uh, which don't want to spoil, but Linux, OpenStack, Kubernetes infrastructure. Um, Ildiko Fonska. Good afternoon. Are you all having a great time with Open Infra? <laughs> Woo! All right, get ready, buckle up, because my fellow speakers and I will take you to a little technology journey. And as Wes mentioned, that will be all about Loki, and I will just repeat, Linux OpenStack Kubernetes infrastructure. So who in the audience have heard of Loki before? All right, we got a few hands. So let's start our trip where it all began. So this diagram is probably uh, resembling memories for some of you. And for others, it looks a little bit more like a history lesson. I will not turn it into one. Um, but for example, I was only seven years old when the initial release of the Linux kernel came out in 1991. And it take much it took a lot of time uh, until I learned and realized how historical moment that was for open source and open source infrastructure. So 19 years later, we had a lot of servers in big warehouses that we called data centers uh, that were running Linux. And what was revolutionary about that is we started to treat these big data centers like if they were one big machine. So if you will, the data center became the new mainframe. And that mainframe needed an operating system. And in the open source space, that operating system is now OpenStack. And what really enabled OpenStack was the success of Linux. Linux as an operating system and Linux as an open source project, or despite of being an open source project, I will leave it up to you to choose which one you go with. And if you look at the timeline a little bit closer, you will see how open source and the success of open source and open source infrastructure accelerated. Because from there, from 2020 when OpenStack was created, it only took four more years to the announcement of Kubernetes. And by today, um, these three uh, infrastructure components became key, and they are frequently used together. And now we are just conveniently calling them the Loki stack. And for many of us nerds, this is already super exciting. But in reality, what is technology if nobody is using it? So when it comes to Loki, Loki currently is powering critical functions around the globe. So a couple of examples, because there's no keynote without CERN. CERN is using Loki to process massive amounts of data that is coming from their experiments to discover, prove, or break the laws of physics. China Telecom is providing connectivity by using Loki through tens of millions of users just in China and even more customers globally. Bloomberg. Bloomberg is using Loki to give all of you information because, let's be honest, we are all really hungry for information these days. Uh, so Bloomberg is supplying you financial data, news, and really all the information you could possibly want. So these organizations are very different, but yet they still have a lot in common. Super user awards. CERN was the first winner, and Bloomberg and China Telecom are both nominees this year, and I will not tell you who the winner is. You will have to wait a little bit longer for that. What else do these organizations share? They all run infrastructure on a massive scale. Stern's OpenStack-powered cloud is over 300,000 cores. 
and they are using OpenStack Magnum to run Kubernetes clusters. China Telecom, they are running Loki in over 700 data centers. Bloomberg, their OpenStack cloud is over 400,000 cores, and they are running hundreds of Kubernetes clusters, both uh, bare metal and virtual. So you might think that this is where this all ends, but that is not exactly true. So let's go back to technology evolution a little bit. We started with single computers, we put them in data centers, we created software to harness the power of those massive, large amounts of resources, and we did all that just to break out of the walls of those data centers, take the cloud computing concept and computational power, and, well, deploy it everywhere. But this is what we are trying to do. But when we are arriving to this modern infrastructure, we have to realize how complex that is. And we also, unfortunately, have to realize that complexity is not going anywhere. However, there is good news in this because there is a solution, which is automation. And if you think that I will send you back to the drawing table, that's not true because the project that delivers you this automation already exists. And it's called Starling X. Starling X took the low-key components, and he flew with them. And Starling X, as an open source cloud platform, doesn't just provide you with the components of the low-key stack, but it also adds those missing pieces that allows you to take low-key outside of the walls of data centers and deploy and manage them as geographically distributed systems on a smaller scale or a large scale. It is all your choice. We announced the project five years and exactly one month ago here in Vancouver. And today, as the next part of our journey, uh, we will dive into the uh, why, what, and how of starting X. And for that, I would like to invite Jeff Gowen to the stage. Hey, everybody. So uh, we are in Vancouver, so I thought I would start my talk in the most Canadian way I could think of, which is, I'm sorry. <laughs> VMs have been around for decades, right? But it was in 2010, and I'm sorry if we're going to inundate you with timelines. You've seen them a couple times already. But in 2010, that's when OpenStack came along with the mission statement, and I'm going to read it out loud, to produce the ubiquitous open source cloud computing platform that will meet the needs of public and private clouds, regardless of size, by being simple to implement and massively scalable. So based on what we heard from Terry, I'd say mission accomplished, right? So OpenStack provides the infrastructure needed to, to deploy VMs at scale. And OpenStack has helped us to realize what would have been considered science fiction 10 to 15 years ago by providing the infrastructure to support the internet and modern networks as we know them. But human nature is to evolve, and the goal line has moved. So now the expectation is for things like self-driving cars, always on connectivity everywhere, uh, smart cities, and the list goes on. Thankfully, in 2014, along came Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is designed for distributed systems. And just like OpenStack provides the infrastructure for vir virtual machines at scale, Starling X provides the infrastructure for Kubernetes at scale in a distributed system. So why am I telling you this? Because at some point, you're likely going to be asked to deploy, manage, operate applications in a distributed network. And when that happens, there's a few things that you might want to have available. So you might want to have a geographically distri distributed solution spanning thousands of systems. You may want to have support for containers and virtual machines out of the box. You may want to have high performance in terms of latency and uptime. Easy automated deployment, that sounds like a no-brainer, right? And operational ease of use features like centralized management and automated operations. What's happening is applications are being pushed closer to the user, and they need infrastructure that can support them where the compute and where the data are. See, suddenly the modern data center starts to look a little different, right? A new data center might actually have wheels. It might have wings, as in the case of a car or a jet fighter. As one of my colleagues recently said to me, there is no center in data center. Now, that sounds like a line out of a Matrix movie, but what if it's true? If it is, what do you do? Well, the good news is you don't have to figure out distributed systems 
by yourself. Starling X has already solved many of the challenges of a distributed system and is adaptable to so many more. If only it were running the slides. Uh, <laughs> so my name's Jeff Gowan, and I'm the marketing director at Wind River, uh, and I'm also an active contributor to the Starling X marketing team. And I'm joined by several community members, you can identify them with these shirts, who would love to get into the technical weeds of Starling X with you over the next two days. Wind River is a contributor, and we are a believer in Starling X. So uh, Ildico just talked about Loki a little bit. So what if you could get Loki with all the pieces assembled and field proven? Well, that's what Starling X is. It is Loki distributed cloud infrastructure, and it's running in some of the most demanding environments today and is adaptable to many, many, many more. Uh, and also, as she mentioned, we are celebrating Starling X's five-year anniversary. So five years ago here in Vancouver, we launched the project, and I was actually uh, with the project from inception, and it is definitely not the same software as it was five years ago. Today, Starling X provides the edge infrastructure for Verizon's 5G network in North America. And I'm going to talk about that more in a little bit because it's a great example of how the project is getting pushed. Because as use cases evolve, so must Starling X. Because if we're only thinking from a data center perspective, we will literally be boxed in and we will be unable to meet the emerging needs of the edge. Next generation use cases need next generation infrastructure. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of food for thought in the immediate, near, and longer term future uh, about deploying applications in a distributed environment. So maybe you're responsible for uh, managing and operating uh, enterprise data or, uh, uh, multiple enterprise sites, each with their own data center. So rather than thinking of them as separate standalone entities, what if you could manage them all centrally? One idea is to think of them as clouds and subclouds rather than separate standalone entities. Each of those sites, of course, has its own needs in terms of software installs, updates, version control, availability, the list goes on. But if you think of those sites as a collective, it gives you more options on how to implement those needs. So for example, how do you keep each site up to date and, on this, and synchronized on the same version while not disrupting service? What about uh, uh, security updates? How do you orchestrate the updates of all the applications needed? These are the types of things that Starling X does. So if you think Starling X might be able to help you with your enterprise sites, come talk to us. So the next example is you know, once you've implemented your distributed system, then how do you scale? So for the last two and a half years, Verizon has relied on Wind River Studio, which has commercially supported Starling X for their 5G network. And with 10,000 sites and growing, they're all about scale. And I'll give you a little secret. Distributed networks are really complex. <laughs> so this is why, in addition to some of the core features of Starling X that include uh, uh, single pane of glass and zero touch automated management, uh, this year, the, the key area of focus is around operations at scale. And there's a number of features in version 8, which was just released. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list because, unfortunately, I don't have time. But if you're interested in some of the latest releases of Starling X and operations uh, of, at scale of distributed systems, come talk to us. So the third example, as we think to uh, modern use cases and use cases of the future, we're going to start to really see how today's technology just isn't going to cut it. The simple fact is distributed is different from the data center, and a data center alone isn't going to be enough to support use cases like a mobile distributed cloud. Uh, so what might that be? That might be a fleet of automobiles that are operating as an autonomous taxi network. It could be a fleet of drones that are being used to distribute medicine into uh, remote environments or to packages to your home. Or it could be uh, traffic control in a smart city that requires V to X connectivity, smart city integration, 5G connectivity, and a myriad of sensors and, and uh, applications that all need to be managed real time at the edge. Whatever the use case is, having a distributed, oh, having a distributed cloud technology will enable some certain things that you're going to want for those use cases, things like predictive maintenance, things like remote monitoring of fleets and your assets, uh, mobile application deployment, and data analytics to improve your operations. 
So I just walked through some examples of existing and potential use cases. And what they all have in common is a distributed cloud hierarchy that can be thought of as clouds and subclouds separated by geography. Now, honestly, we're just getting started. But Starling X has a serious head start. Telecom operators, they've been building out their networks for the connect connectivity for years. And other industries, like automotive, are starting to catch up on their own digitization journey. And what's happening is this convergence of initiatives is opening the door for Starling X to be able to play a role in outside of telco. If you think of it this way, telco has been hardening Starling X for the rest of the world. So on the topic of telco, Excuse me, one area that is super hot in telco and very important is energy efficiency. And one way that Starling X is addressing that is through extreme efficiency. So one example of that is the fact that we can now run on a single core of the Intel fourth generation Xeon processors. Some of you might know that as Sapphire Rapids. Why this is a big deal is because by, by being able to run on a single core, that means you can run other applications with the existing cores, and that could potentially reduce the number of servers that you need per site, which will then in turn, of course, reduce the uh, amount of power that's needed for those sites. Now, that may not be a big deal for a single site, but when you multiply that across thousands of sites, it suddenly becomes a big deal because you just don't have the same economies of scale with the single data sites as you do with a huge data center. So we have a, a demonstration of Sapphire Rapids and Starling X in the Starling X booth. Come take a look at that. Another example is ARM. So ARM recently joined the Starling X community, uh, and there is a POC of Starling X running on ARM uh, in, the in the Starling X booth. And there's also a session tomorrow. It's called Power Efficiency in VRAN and Open RAN, uh, where we'll get into the details of that POC. So I'm going to wrap it up by just highlighting a few things. Number one, the world is evolving quickly. Number two, legacy technology is awesome at what it does, but it can only do so much. If you think of the networks of the future, uh, there's only a portion of it that's going to be within the four walls of a data center, and there's going to be an increasing portion of it that could be pretty much anywhere you can think of. And number three, we need to think out of the data center box, because if we assume that distributed edge is the same as the data center, data center we'll miss. We will miss on delivering health care for remote areas. We will miss on smart, coordinated city planning. And I hate to say it, we will miss on drone delivery of cold beer and pizza. <laughs> However, I, oh, sorry, before I get to that, uh, the reason why is because the edge won't be secure. It won't be manageable. It won't be reliable. And all the things that are going to be required for us to have the confidence to both uh, provide and consume those services. But if we think distributed, then all of a sudden we're thinking about new commerce models, new innovation models, actual evolution because we have the actual infrastructure su to support it. Again, next generation use cases need next generation infrastructure. And this is why Starling X wants your contribution. What do you want to build? What applications do you need to support? If you think Starling X could potentially be used for, for you, we invite you to come talk to us. Come grab us in the booth. Pretty much anybody who's wearing a shirt that looks like this, grab them and ask them about Starling X and how it could potentially help with your use case. And if you do a search for Starling X in the agenda, you're, you're going to see a bunch of sessions. Uh, there's the, the energy session that I mentioned that's happening tomorrow. Um, and I wanted to call out one session in particular on Thursday, <coughs> which is the hands-on session. So if you want to roll up your sleeves and really get into the technology, join us Thursday morning, uh, and you'll get the opportunity to do that. Uh, so with that, I will say thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. This was very exciting. I always get the chills when I learn more about the capabilities of Starling X, the use cases that it supports today, and also the use cases that it will enable tomorrow and further out in the future. And um, Jeff already mentioned a couple of sessions, uh, conference sessions that you can find on the schedule. But I also like to give a reminder that Starling X is not just a software 
piece, it is also an open source community. So please not just go to those sessions, but also keep the project teams gathering in mind, where Starling X has a session tomorrow afternoon starting at 2.30 p.m. And go and mingle with the contributors of the project. Ask them about how it works, and ask them about how you can get involved. Uh, go to the hands-on workshop, and we also have a forum session Thursday afternoon, I think it is at 2 p.m. So go and find the people who are working on that platform and have a conversation with them. And now, with all that, we sadly arrived to the last part of our journey. But I already told you to buckle up. So this is now when you will be holding on to your seats because we are taking a magnifying glass and we are taking an even closer look at Loki and more specifically the OpenStack and Kubernetes parts of it and how they are working together, not just as projects, but also as communities. And our next speakers will not only just speak, but also show you all that as part of a live demo. So please welcome on stage uh, Kendall, Matt and Guillerme. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. Hi, I'm Guillerme. I'm senior OpenStack engineer at Vaxhost. And I'm Kendall Nelson, a senior upstream developer advocate at the Open Infra Foundation. So, Guillerme here is going to dive right into this demo so that we can make sure it completes in our eight minute segment. So basically, Matt and I are going to introduce the topic Loki, which you may have heard of by now. <laughs> but Guillerme over here is going to um, do an upgrade of a Kubernetes cluster running on top of OpenStack. And he will also be spinning up a new cluster on top of OpenStack. So. We've heard about this Loki thing now, hopefully. <laughs> so this comes from um, it, the OpenStack user surveys that we've been seeing over the last couple of years. There is a preference and a pattern for using open source for the whole infrastructure stack, specifically using Linux, OpenStack, and Kubernetes together to provide your infrastructure. These three projects together provide a fully open source stack from top to bottom. So quick show of hands. Who here is already running Kubernetes on OpenStack? That's quite a few, a quite a few. <laughs> but I'd like to take a minute to talk to, the, to those of you who didn't raise your hands. There are lots of reasons to run Kubernetes. But one of the biggest ones is that it's cloud agnostic. It allows your users to focus on the needs of the application rather than the cloud that it's running on. This also means it's possible to reuse Kubernetes deployments across clouds. If it's currently running on public cloud, there's a good chance that you can run it on OpenStack with minimal or even no changes, and vice versa. But of course, there are also reasons against. And one I've heard frequently is complexity. The good news is, if you're running OpenStack, you've already implemented much of that complexity, and your Kubernetes cluster can just use it. And you can reuse it as many times as you like by running multiple clusters. Kubernetes clusters on OpenStack are cheap and easy to create. And to OpenStack, it's just a regular tenant workload. No admin privileges are required, no special installation is required, and your users can even do it for themselves. OpenStack was one of the first clouds to have native integrations in Kubernetes. They're very well tested and very mature. Running OpenStack on Kubernetes is a cheap and easy and safe choice. But don't take my word for it. Let's have a look at what Guillermo has been doing so we can see it for ourselves. Sure, Matt. So basically what I did here I'm logged in as a member user of a project. And to be honest, there's nothing new here for whom already used OpenStack and Magnum before. I just navigated here to the container infra. I just selected the cluster I wanted to upgrade, selected the cluster template with a higher version of Kubernetes, and that's it. To create a cluster, simple as well. So just open up a form, 
just uh, put the, the, the name, uh, the cluster template, a key pair, and the number of nodes. And that's where the magic happens. Actually, uh, the key point here is how the magic happens, actually. Uh, on this deployment here in particular, we are using a, a, a new Magnum driver. It's called uh, Magnum Cluster API. It's a driver developed by Vexhost. So as you can see here, it, this is the actual driver working. So that's cool, isn't it, Kendall? Very, very cool. With two clicks, you are able to effectively upgrade a whole, a whole cluster. And I think that <laughs> we can all agree that that's a really a refreshing <laughs> upgrade experience. Uh, cluster creation is cheap and easy, too, like Matt said. You had a predefined cluster template, and by customizing three parameters, I think it was, you can stamp out as many as you want. Everyone can have their own cluster. He can have a cluster. You can have a cluster. I can have a cluster. <laughs> and as you um, mentioned, the Magnum API driver, I know that that makes use of another open source project called Cappy. Matt, can you explain a little bit about Cappy? Sure. Cluster API, or Cappy, is a Kubernetes native API for managing Kubernetes clusters. It can install a new cluster. It can scale or reconfigure your existing cluster. And as Guillermo has just shown us, it can quickly and easily upgrade a cluster. And it supports lots of clouds, not just OpenStack. There are providers available for just about anything you're likely to be running on, whether that's public cloud or private cloud or even bare metal. And wherever you deploy it, the Kubernetes that it deploys will always be the same, managed in the same way and exposing the capabilities of whichever cloud it's running on. So on OpenStack, for example, that means you can do things like mixing and matching virtual and bare metal workers all in the same cluster. Another advantage of Cappy is that it's managed under the same umbrella as Kubernetes itself. So it always supports the latest releases. By building on Cluster API, Magnum can take advantage of first-class Kubernetes native management tools and expose them for an OpenStack native API. So there we go. We have the upgrade complete. We have a cluster created complete. I just did here with this comment here, just pulling out uh, the config of the cluster I created. So it writes a file on the disk. I just export it, and there we go. That's the cluster we created. So simple and easy. I love it when a live demo works. <laughs> it's awesome that we can. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, it's awesome that we can see these commands actually completing in real time. And that was all maybe six-ish minutes. Um, and even better that you are actually able to use the OpenStack CLI and dashboard that most of us are already familiar with. So, Guillermo, can you actually tell us a little bit about the environment that we're looking at, too? Sure. Um, that's a proof of concept box. Uh, this is running inside Atmosphere Cloud. That's the public cloud for Vexhost. So, it's running Atmosphere. It's another project that Vexhost has developed. Uh, it's an open source project as well. It's responsible to deploy uh, OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. So, my colleague Rico Lin. He's going to be talking about, uh, about Atmosphere in a little bit more details during the event. But that's it. So this environment is running Atmosphere, and it, it comes with Magnum Cluster API by default. So Awesome. So while we have this lovely audience here today, um, what sort of help can we get, ask them for uh, in this space for CAPI and Magnum? So the CAPI community is vibrant and diverse, but we'd still like to see much more participation from members of the OpenStack community. If you're an OpenStack developer, we'd really like you to come and contribute to one of the OpenStack integrations. Please come and talk to us about it in our forum session on Thursday afternoon. Yeah, so uh, Atmosphere and Magnum Cluster API, they are open source. Just feel free to go to uh, Vexhost GitHub, GitHub repository. Uh, you can just clone the, the project and try it out by yourself. We'll be really happy to have your contribution there. Awesome. <laughs> Lots of places to get involved, and we really need everyone's input. 
I want to give a huge thank you to those such as yourselves that have paved the way to get us to the point where we can use these projects together to make our Loki stack. And I hope that the audience would now agree that we've proven the Loki stack to them and they're ready to go try it out for themselves. Thank you all for giving us the time and yeah, demo that works. <laughs>take a step back in time for a moment. Um, from 2010 to 2011, we kind of saw OpenStack getting started. Uh, hopefully, we'll see a really cool graphic here in a moment. Um, and it wasn't very big. We didn't have a lot of people. There weren't a whole lot of projects. Um, but hey, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> um, if you take a look at this image, so there's all these blue dots. Those are actually contributors working on the projects in OpenStack. And the orange dots are the projects themselves. So that little orange dot off to the left, all by its lonesome, but kind of connected in, that's Neutron. And the one that's trying to be a nebula of its own at the bottom, <laughs> but still connected, that's Swift. <laughs> Um, but today, we have a much more dense and interconnected community. And there are more projects and more contributors than we've had before. But being able to see the community represented in this way is thanks to Biturgia. The OpenStack dashboard that these images were pulled from is now available for your own perusal. So anyone can nerd out like I did and start doing visualization of growth factors in OpenStack. And where obviously containers and integration with Kubernetes weren't the only factors between 2010 and now, you can see the projects highlighted that are related to containers like Magnum, Cola, and OpenStack Helm. I, I really, really love this. <laughs> but if you want to dig in as much as I did, the data is now available to you via the new OpenStack dashboard. And if you have questions, Biturgia will be hanging out in the metrics corner throughout the event in the marketplace. Go check it out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kendall, and also thanks to Guillermo and Matt. Did you all see how smoothly that live demo went? Was it amazing? Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> and through that demo, you could see how smoothly and nicely integrated OpenStack and Kubernetes are, but that really is the result of two very large and very active communities actively collaborating and working together to make that happen. And you can learn much more about Loki this week. So even though that this is the end of our little trip today, this is the beginning for all of you because this is when you can go and mingle with fellow attendees, contributors, and really anyone who you can find around you, like-minded people, come up with new ideas and collaborate on solutions. So make sure to attend the conference sessions, go check out the PTG and mingle with the contributors there, and go and give feedback and talk about uh, ideas and priorities at the forum sessions. And with all that, thank you all for your attention, and remember to have a great time with Open Infra. So the first segment is done. Thank you to Ildico for hosting it. I hope you noticed that one of the things that we did really intentionally with the keynotes this time is bringing up the contributors who are building the software and showing it with demos and providing some really technical overviews. So we have a lot more demos still to go. Um, but before we get to the next one, you know, OpenStack and Kubernetes integration that we just heard about is one of the most commonly talked about topics at the Open Infra Summit. But within the summit, and even around the entire world, the most talked about topic right now is AI. And so we're going to have a segment around AI and how different open source technologies are um, pushing the boundaries for this exciting and 
you'll see somewhat terrifying <laughs> use case. <laughs> but um, to talk more about AI and the open source technology impact, please join me in welcoming Mark Collier. All right. Thank you, Allison. Well, I was going to ask if any of you all have heard of this thing called AI, but apparently you definitely have now if you haven't before. Well, I think, I think there's a 1.5 trillion reasons why people are talking about AI, which apparently is how big the market's going to be in a few years. And I want to talk about it today. First of all, in a few minutes, we're going to have a couple of amazing demos where we're going to show off some, some AI and open infrastructure in action. But first, I want to talk about uh, uh, AI and from kind of two different points of view. One is to look at the impact open source is having on AI and how it's being developed how that is changing the game in the AI world. And then I also want to talk about how AI is influencing, impacting how software is getting developed, particularly when it comes to open source. Now, when it comes to AI and giant companies that have been uh, investing in it for years, one of them is Google. You've probably heard of them. And recently, there was a thorough analysis that was done within Google, and it sort of leaked out and apparently made it to the press and so one of the big headlines was the author who, you know, I think has uh, not been revealed yet, but probably uh, might be in a little bit of trouble. But I think they did a very honest analysis and they said, we have no moat and neither does OpenAI. And this is directly a result of open source. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the background. But um, if you don't know what a moat is, it's basically on an old castle. It's the water around there that's supposed to help your castle stop being invaded. In this case, we're thinking about com competition and people trying to come in and get your customers and take away your competitive advantages. So this is a pretty big admission, um, albeit uh, leaked out. But um, one of the big takeaways here was this quote which said, you know, while we've been squabbling, here the references to Google and OpenAI, a third faction has quietly been eating our lunch I'm talking, of course, about open source. And so, you know, I personally think it's a lot of fun to drain moats with uh, open source communities. So I'm all for this. And I think, you know, 1.5 trillion is a lot of lunch to eat. So I think we're, we're all going to be eating well in the next few years if this trend continues. And to take a closer look at the data, one of the other pieces of analysis, and keep in mind, this has only happened in the last three months. You know, three months ago, we all believed that the only companies with access to this kind of powerful technology were three or four of the biggest companies in the world, the Googles of the world, uh, the Metas, et cetera, OpenAI. And what they ha has happened in just the past few weeks is through a lot of these open source models, as they uh, said here, they, meaning the uh, open source faction, are doing things with $100 and 13 billion parameters that uh, we struggle to do with $10 million and 540 billion parameters. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether some of these new models are truly open source, depending on the license, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna spend uh, time on that today. But um, the bottom line is open source is absolutely having a massive impact on AI, and that the space is just moving really quickly. And the real summary here was we have no secret sauce, so you know I'm happy to toast to the end of secret sauce, but may not be gone forever, but certainly I think we are seeing signs that open source is having a massive impact directly on the development of AI. Now, talking about how open source, uh, rather, is being influenced by AI, you know, I've been talking to a lot of developers, trying to get a, a feel for how people are using AI in the development of software and how they're feeling about it. and. Uh, one of those developers who shall remain nameless said something that may sound eerily familiar. <laughs> oh, I meant to blur out his face. Um, this is awkward. He, he wanted to me to be sure to tell him he's a former software developer. But uh, in any event, in a more serious note, you know, we're al already seeing how AI is changing how software is being written, how code is being produced. Um, definitely some developers are producing it, but I think the truth is we just do not know what the long-term impact is going to be on how software is produced. But we're already seeing some early signs of the impact and how it's affecting open source communities and other, other businesses. You know, one example is in the Python community. 
they're starting to get more and more code submissions that need to be reviewed that are being generated by these sort of AI assistants. And it's creating quite a, quite a problem for the people trying to review the code. Um, quite frankly, some of the code is not very good, right? These AI systems are not magic. They don't actually always create great code. And oftentimes, if the so-called you know, contributor who submitted it is asked questions in the review process, they can't really answer them if they didn't write the code. So we're already seeing how this is, this is creating problems, but it's also creating opportunities, right? And if you look at the publishing world, the world of sci-fi, we have this fascinating evolution in which you know, sci-fi has been writing about AI for years. Now AI is writing about sci-fi. So, you know, it's kind of a, a funny turn of events, and I, I do have to say, though, this community, this pu sci-fi publisher community, I feel like they should have seen it coming, <laughs> if anyone. But um, clearly all this change does create some opportunity, but it does create some fear. And, uh, you know, wherever there is fear, uh, governments are sure to appear. And we are definitely seeing that happen. Uh, Chat GPT was banned in Italy and unbanned, and EU is thinking about passing various rules and regulations. But clearly, everybody is not really prepared, I think, for where this is all going. We first of all don't really know where it's going, but we're going to have to be on top of it. So some questions that we have to consider, what about the incentive alignment between organizations and open source moving forward? It's not going to be business as usual. You know, what, are we prepared for a world with code development without humans? You know, in the future, more code will be written by machines than humans. So this is, this is coming. In a lot of ways, it's here already. So are we prepared? Probably not. But this is the kind of community that can tackle these sorts of problems. You know, how will the AI license us its code? There's a whole series of uh, lawyers trying to figure this out right now. So I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to try to skip that one. But it's going to have to happen. How will we accept their code? And perhaps the biggest question of all, how will we accept AI as a member of our community? <laughs> it looks pretty harmless, you know? I would accept them. Uh, but, you know, these are things we're going to have to think about. And we go back to the original premise of these two questions. How is open source impacting AI? How is AI impacting open source? The reality is um, these are inseparable at this point. You really can't separate the concepts at that point. It's the both are amplifying each other. Ideas are being submitted, combined, recombined, that are you know, both AI-generated and human-generated. And let's face it, all those AI code generators were trained on open source code written by humans. But as we move forward, how can you really separate the two? They're, they're sort of inseparable. The lines are blurring between human and machine. And we won't see a lot of code produced without some AI influence in the future. But the bottom line is we have a huge opportunity. That $1.5 trillion will probably keep everybody's uh, in attention, trying to figure out these hard problems. And right here in the Open Infra community, we have lots of software that's already being used in production to power these massive AI systems. A lot of which you might not be aware of, but hopefully you will be in just a moment. And one great example of that is our next speaker, who does have a demo. And he is a longtime uh, OpenStack Swift contributor. He was PTL for many years. Some of you may already know him. From the past, he's spent the last several years at NVIDIA, and he's going to talk about how they're using OpenStack Swift at insanely massive scale to process all kinds of awesome data and machine learning. So, John Dickinson, please come on up. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. What I want to talk about is what does it take to actually do a lot of the machine learning? There's been huge, huge advances super rapidly. It seems like every week there's something new. But when we peel back all of the new tools and abstractions and frameworks, we still see we have some familiar foundations. With all technology, we still have to deal with compute, networking, and infrastructure. And it's that storage infrastructure that I want to talk about. And how do we enable these kind of new tools? So on the compute and networking side, there's great advances. At NVIDIA, we've got things like the Grace chips and the Hopper chips and the Spectrum switches that are really pushing the edge of what's possible with uh, machine learning. But let's talk about storage. Storage 
how does that fit into the picture? AI and ML are taking off like a rocket ship, and the fuel that's powering that is data. So as storage providers, our job is to put as much data into that rocket engine as quickly as possible. And when you've got thousands of GPUs powering through petabytes of data, you need to be able to be able to have high capacity and high availability and high aggregate throughput and concurrency. These are some of the baseline features that you need to enable you to put that fuel into the rocket ship as quickly as possible. But let's briefly talk about what these ML jobs look like, because it's really good to understand what the actual usage patterns are for this data access, but when you're going to build storage systems to support it. So in general, at a high level, uh, a, a machine learning job will load some data, and then it will iterate on that, and it will shuffle the data every single time. So it cycles through the data over and over and over again in different orders. And each time it does that, it's called an epic. So from a storage perspective, it would be great if you can reuse that data. And so you only have to load it into the GPU memory once, and then it can uh, shuffle the data and retrain, and shuffle the data and retrain, and so on and so forth. So if you say, I've got 500 gigabytes of data that can fit inside of the memory on one server, and you can do that. You load the data in, you shuffle it, and you move it around, and things like that. But the problem is, data sets are getting way bigger than that, and they can't fit in GPU memory. And in fact, they can't even fit on the flash storage that's inside of a particular uh, server. So you think, great, well, let's use something like object storage, and that's really great. But a challenge there for machine learning practitioners is that it's a different API. Programming languages come with like f equals open, and they don't come with object level primitives. And for the repeated data access, you can think, I know, I'll use cach caching, but that's going to add a lot of complexity to the whole put, how you put things together. And so you're stuck with this challenge that the people who are doing the machine learning are faced with these massive infrastructure problems of caching layers and file APIs versus object APIs and having to copy data between different systems. And that's not what they want to spend their time doing. And we're at an infrastructure conference. So our job is to build the infrastructure that enables them to do those things that were previously impossible. We have to build that infrastructure so that it gets out of the way and enables them to do their job. And so the users need these tools and abstractions to deal with the large amounts of data, to understand what kind of data they have, and to make it available to the GPUs as quickly as possible. So in addition to having really great compute platforms, you also have to have a really good storage platform. So to solve these problems, we use two abstractions. We have something called an inner ring and something called an outer ring. And the inner ring is high speed. It's low latency. It is tied to a specific GPU cluster. And normally, it's going to look like file storage to, uh, to the end users. This is the storage acceleration layer. This is where caching would live. This is where the working set of data would live. And on the other hand, you've got the outer ring, which is very large capacity and high throughput, high availability. But not just HA in the sense that it's always turned on, but in the sense that it can be connected to many different GPU clusters at the same time. And this becomes the foundation for that whole data storage strategy. This is a very, very good fit for object storage. And Swift is one of the tools that we're using to uh, internally implement our outer ring. So we first put the data into the outer ring. Then we can make it available to whatever GPU cluster we need and uh, accelerate it as it's accessed through the inner ring pattern. And we get a lot of major wins from this. The first one, and the most obvious ones, is that we can support massive data sets that won't fit on single servers. We also are able to improve performance, because when you load that data into the GPU, you only have to load it from the outer ring once. And after that, you can accelerate it, and, and subsequent epochs can go to the inner ring storage. And you also get workload portability, because the outer ring, that foundation, is connected to many different uh, GPU clusters. And so uh, the, the job can run from many different locations. And so we use many different storage systems and storage providers and, and storage partners. And we want, because we want to enable our users to use whatever they have available and uh, the best tools that they have available. But the way we then have to do that is standardize around APIs. On the file side, it looks a lot like uh, POSIX and NFS. And then on the object side, it's going to look like S3 APIs and Azure Blob and the Swift API. 
So Swift is something that we use internally. It's a great, uh, it's a great storage system for the outer ring. It has high throughput, high capacity, and we've got several large deployments there. Right now, we've got about an exabyte of Swift deployed uh, supporting many different GPUs clusters. But giving people that inner ring and outer ring is really great, but it's not quite sufficient. Because the problem is then, what data do I actually have? And when you get bigger and bigger data sets, it gets harder and harder to understand what these data sets actually look like. How can I explore petabyte scale data sets on my laptop? So we've created also a data set service. And its end goal is to give users a way to explore things without having to worry about that underlying storage. This is what I'm going to demo, kind of the end user view of putting these storage systems together in a way that makes the large scale ML possible. So first, I'm going to load a data set into Swift. Then I'm going to explore it in a Jupyter Notebook uh, without having to worry about the storage, and then finally run a small uh, ML task on it. So first, I took an extract of some of our internal Confluence pages and extracted that as JSON. And um, we can see here that it's a bunch of different files. The first one starts with 026. And it's about 30 kilobytes. And it's got an MD5 sum that starts with F3, E6. We'll come back to that. And the structure of these JSON files is pretty simple. But one of the key things, again, we'll come back to in a second, is this source URL, that every, every file has that. So um, when I create the data set, what this is going to do is upload this data into Swift. And then I also noticed I told it about the source URL key there. Um, it's going to upload that data into Swift. It's going to create it inside of a new container there. And then from that point, we can go explore that container inside of Swift using standard Swift APIs and see exactly what data is there. Now, the point of that is the data is exactly the same as we started with. The names are exactly the same. The first one that I'm going to pull up here is uh, starts with 026. You're going to see that it's basically 30 kilobytes, and the MD5 sum is exactly the same as the one that we had locally. The really cool thing about this is that there's nothing standing in the way of the actual data access. There's nothing translating or transferring that. You don't have to go through other systems. You can still directly use the object storage. So here you can see that object, that 026 object, is still exactly the same one that we had that we started with locally. So once I have this data set created, then I've started up on my laptop a, uh, a little Jupyter Notebook to say, let's explore this data set and, and uh, see what it looks like without having to load or even worry about all of the data storage. So when I start the, the Jupyter Notebook, uh, the first thing I do is I pull up a list of some of the data sets that I have. You can see there's several of them there as I was building this over and over again, preparing for this. And then I specifically load the one I'm interested here, in here, the one I loaded, John Vancouver de Demo. In that, you can look at the, the metadata. You can see that it's 40 files in total, and it's you know, a few megabytes in size. Um, and then the really cool part here is that you can convert it immediately to a pandas data frame, which is the exact tools that people are used to using. And when I do that, note that it has the source URL there exposed, which means that I can now start playing with a little bit more about what I knew that was in that data and start doing different things on it. Other examples is let's chart out the sizes of, these, of these, this data set and see what it looks like. And you can see most of them are small and one of them is kind of big. But what's really cool about this is in no point whatsoever this, uh, when I've been exploring this, have I ever hit Swift. This is the log indexes here. And you can see there's no requests that go to Swift. So if I wanted to actually load one of those data, uh, data uh, objects in there, I can do that without having to um, know anything about how it was actually stored. And here where I load it out and show out the first 100 bytes, you can see that that's the content. And once I have that content loaded, I could put it through a, a simple uh, Langchain summarization tool and figure out that, oh, well, this, this particular file, this extract from this Confluence page was about how to handle some communications during, during an incident. So in review, what I was able to do here is load the data directly into Swift, explore the metadata without having to have that data loaded locally at all, and then load some of the data from the data set without having to worry about what the underlying storage was and then integrate that into existing tools, uh, things that are available elsewhere. 
So by putting together these storage and data platforms, we're able to, oh, I was able to, uh, yeah, there was the one, uh, sorry about that. There was the one actual uh, request that went back to the, the log index system, and you could see that it was actually that single uh, request to hit the uh, back to the Swift cluster. So by putting together these, uh, these storage uh, systems, we're able to solve these uh, problems for ML practitioners at scale without having to, them having to worry about those underlying storage systems. This is what helps us to continually feed that machine learning rocket. And Swift specifically has been a key part of one of our internal systems to help grow our storage platforms. <laughs> before you go, before you go, I'm going to hit you with one more question. Sure, Mark. So, well, I was backstage. I think I heard you say NVIDIA is running an exabyte of OpenStack Swift for your AI system. So that's incredible. I imagine you must have been making some improvements to Swift over the years to get ready for this type of crazy workload and scale. It has grown very quickly, and that it's been critical for us to be able to have access to the, the code, participate in the community, push the changes back up, because anything at that scale has to grow super rapidly, and we continually find new ways to improve performance and improve the scaling ability. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for the presentation and Thanks, Mark. talking about your Swift at NVIDIA AI use case. So next up, we have another awesome user who's running OpenStack at crazy scale for AI, and we're going to have Nathan Harper from GraphCore and John Garbett from Stack HPC. So come on up. Hi, I'm Nathan Harper from Stack HPC. Uh, from Stack HPC, from GraphCore. Sorry, <laughs> there's too much Stack HPC going on. Um, so I, I'm really pleased to be here to be able to talk to you about how we have been accelerating, uh, accelerating development using OpenStack and infrastructure as code. Um, so very quickly, who are GraphCore? So we develop hardware, software, and services that have been designed from the ground up for AI and machine learning. So the focus for us um, for, the, for this particular project has been our IPU machine. So this is the system that's down the bottom, bottom right-hand side. So although this has got a server form factor, it's actually, this is a, this is a network accelerator so a, or a network appliance. So this has got four of our IPU processors in it, and um, then it's accessed over the network from an application server using our IPU over fabric protocol, which leverages RDMA. So the challenge that we, that we run into is we were building our systems that look like this um, effectively by hand. So each one of those racks contains one of our reference pod 64s. And although we've got automation and config management for managing the actual servers, managing the infrastructure, so the IPU machines, managing the network infrastructure, um, that, that is all very static. If we had any requirements for any alternative configurations, for virtualization for Kubernetes, all of that had to be managed by hand and managed centrally. So um, we were really challenged to how, how do we improve our uh, developer enablement? How do we make sure that our developers have got access to the infrastructure and the systems that they, that they need when they need it? And the byproduct for that is also to improve our utilization and so to, you know, to ensure that we don't have systems that are sat waiting for um, reconfiguration to be upgraded for the config to be changed so that they can, they can then be used. So uh, we decided to build a Loki-based IPU cloud. So this is uh, built primarily on OpenStack. And we developed the concept of our vPod, or our virtual pod. So um, a vPod includes our IPU machines includes the application servers that, that users will be using to, to actually drive those IPUs and the networks associated with them. And so we had three principal requirements when we, uh, when we developed these. So that was around having kind of isolation, trying to provoy, prevent noisy neighbor, trying to prevent um, you know, users from accidentally trampling all over each other. Um, they also had to be performant, so we, we didn't want to sacrifice any of the performance that we get by um, 
by, by automating this way. And ideally, we also wanted to make this self-service so that users could drive their own, uh, you know, drive their own destiny rather than having to rely upon on, uh, central services. So rather than going and doing this alone, we enlisted the support of Stack HPC, who've got a wealth of experience with uh, running high-performance workloads inside OpenStack. So I'm going to hand you over to John, who's going to be able to tell you a little more. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I'm John Garbutt from Stack HPC, and I'm going to dig into some of the bits and pieces we've been working on. So the, the fruits of this collaboration between Stack HPC and GraphCore. So I'm going to start with looking at the isolated vPods. So we're using Ironic. And with that, we're using Neutron, and in particular, it's networking generic switch driver. And what that lets us do is it, it lets us reach out to a physical switch and change the access VLAN. So if you go back to that rack of IPU machines that Nathan was introducing, there's 16 IPU machines in there, and that allows us to move from 16 isolated IPU machines, all in their own VLAN, to a rack that's joined to multiple racks all together into one unit. And we get to move between that as the use cases require that. So that's one side of it on the IPU machines. So to talk to the IPU machines, we need some x86 machines running the Poplar SDK. So to start with, there's four x86 machines in each of these racks. And we can use those as bare metal machines with an Ironic. And that's great. But very often, we need to slice it up a bit thinner than that. So we could, for example, have 16 VMs in, uh, using Nova and KVM and slicing that up. And each of those VMs can be on a separate VLAN talking to the IP machines. So you've got that ability to have you know, one multi-rack system or lots of these small development environments. So that's kind of the isolated vPods, the slicing and dicing. So these need to perform to work well. In particular, the Poplar SDK, in order to talk to those IP machines across the network, we need to have RDMA connectivity on the network. And we do that using SRRV, so passing the, the network card into the VM. So we don't just use any old SRV. We're using um, VFLAG, using an open um, OVS offload SRV. And what that really gives us is it's for a machine that's got 100 gig Ethernet bonded, we can get that full performance inside the VM. And that's both for the RDMA connectivity and for TCP connectivity, reaching out to NFS storage and such like. So we've got the network sorted. We've got those things connected together. And we've got that um, using Loki to get that sort of dynamic infrastructure. So we need to really test the performance. And for that, we're using MLPerf. So with MLPerf, the, the basic idea was we test and make sure that in all of this virtual world, are we getting the same performance we got in bare metal? And we're able to do that and get that, make that repeatable with a whole um, bunch of things. We'll go into more detail in our breakout session later. So all of this is for naught if the users can't actually use it when they need to. So for this, we're bringing the open source project called Azimuth. This was started in Jasmine, which is a UK institution for environmental science. And at Stack HPC, we've been working at lots of different um, scientific institutions within the UK to sort of um, apply azimuth to different situations. So for example, um, IRC infrastructure, Dirac supercomputers, um, recently with the SKA UK Regional Centre, and a, a lot of that work's been in concert with Cambridge University. And so with that, we've built up a set of reference platforms. We're actually using Cluster API to drive Kubernetes on OpenStack. We've got um, full stack Loki apps in there. And this isn't just a sort of static set of apps. This is extensible. And GraphCore have, taken, uh, have been able to take this and actually package up the environments that they need to offer. So I'm going to hand back to Nathan, who's going to go through bits and pieces of what um, GraphCore have been doing with this stack. So um, the advantage of uh, making use of Azimuth is um, that because it's it's using Ansible and Terraform on the back end. That means that we can in quite happily inject any of our own configuration, any of our own orchestration that we need to into that. Um, so by as, as a cloud provider being able to develop 
applications and appliances with all the sensible defaults baked into them. It means that users don't need to know the ins and outs of the infrastructure. They don't need to know how to turn on SRIV or to ensure they've ended up with the right flavors to, to achieve their full fat performance. Um, so, so this, this runs, um, we have your pre-built uh, pre images built by Packer. Um, the, this means that all the applications and configuration is, is pre-baked in, and then uh, Ansible then applies the Terraform um, to, to apply that to the cloud. And then once, uh, once it's been stood up, then users can access it either via, um, via SSH or via a web console that is, that is accessible through, a, through the Zenith proxy built into. Um, built into Azimuth. So uh, demo time, I'm hoping the other uh, presenters haven't used up all of the kind of demo luck. Um, so, um, so I can just very briefly show you some of the user experience. Uh, so this is the Azimuth front end, and these are some of our popular appliances um, that I've, I've pre-built. And um, so the kinds of options that, that users can, can access. They can choose their name, what operating system they're going to use, um, in this case, what style of IPU machine, how many, they, how many they want. What you'll see is actually some of these options are, are mutable. So once a user has deployed, uh, deployed a system, they can actually choose to resize it again at a later date once they've you know, um, you know, worked out what you know, they might start small and then choose to, to increase it to, to later. And um, one of the things we've used to, to drive our utilization is by uh, setting maximum lifetime so that things don't just end up languishing. So uh, in the background, um, this is actually running, uh, uh, because we're running Ansible, we can use Aura to uh, grab all of the, uh, the output. This is quite useful for, for debugging. And as you can see, this is just running, running through some, some Terraform. So, um, the advantage of making use of our Terraform modules is that we actually we don't need any other fixed infrastructure to run this. So um, we've got a, a small vpod here, which has got um, a couple of application servers and some of our IPU machines. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an extra couple of IPU machines into this. And then go ahead and run the Terraform. Um, so I'm just adding uh, another pair of IPU machines. So these IPU machines are enrolled uh, via Ironic. Um, we're skipping over the vast majority of the functionality. We don't need to worry about pixie booting and provisioning it. But the main thing really is that we want it to manage the network interfaces and move them into the correct VLAN. So when I'm running this, um, this is going to be ironic is calling out to uh, Neutron and NGS, which is going to update the VLANs, the access ports that these IPU machines are connected to. And so this means that we can just really treat these IPU machines as, as first class open, open stack citizens. Um, so, and once this is done, I've hopefully got a, um, oh, there we go. As we can see, the ping that I had to an IPU machine has now started running which means that all of our networking has been connected back up again. Um, so um, what's next? And so um, if you're interested in IPUs and, um, and you're making use of uh, the uh, IPUs because you want to run your own AI, um, you can try out IPUs for free in Paperspace, which is um, uh, you can access by the first link. If you want to try Azimuth in your own OpenStack cloud, then you can also take a look there. and um, if you're interested in knowing a little bit more or finding out about some of the um, some of the more in-depth bits and pieces that we ran through when we did this, we've got our breakout session later on this week. So, thank you very much. All right. So, a uh, quick question: You mentioned paper space and some of these other environments you've got running OpenStack, but uh, how many OpenStack clouds have you got? What else are you using it for in AI? Uh, so we've, we're up to about five OpenStack clouds now, and um, you're running on, I don't know, 20, 25,000 cores at this point. Nice. Um, the, uh, one of the things that's been a real enabler is that as well as running our self-service systems that I've been able to show you today, um, we also have Slurm-based HPC systems, we have CI-driven workloads. All of this is able to run inside uh, your single control plane, a single OpenStack system. And 
it's a pool, so um, you know, we can move resources between those workloads depending upon what is, what is needed. All right, well, thank you all very much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Well, as I mentioned, they do have a session uh, that you want to definitely attend and learn more. And as we wrap up this AI segment, just another reminder, there's tons of conversations going on all week. This is the place to talk about open source infrastructure, AI, and the intersection there. Here's a few other sessions that you want to check out. And that's it for our AI segment. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Yeah, that was very interesting. Uh, it is uh, super interesting to see how open source is impacting AI and obviously causing that massive growth. But anytime you have that kind of growth, security obviously becomes an issue. So um, coincidentally, that's what our next segment is about. Uh, let me bring on our the um, op uh, executive director for the Open Infra Foundation, Jonathan Bryce. <laughs> Thank you, Wes. And I just wanted to actually take a minute to, uh, to recognize Wes and Allison, who were promoted to VPs in the Open Infra Foundation earlier this year. So congratulations, Wes and Allison. <laughs> Our lovely hosts for the day. So Wes mentioned that we're gonna talk a little bit about security now. And when I talk about security, I always talk about how security is a very very uh, layered and complex topic because there's nothing static about security in the technology world. There are always new techniques and new technologies that we need to be implementing. And if we think about the infrastructure landscape, we started with servers and VMs in, in, uh, in kind of data centers, early clouds, and a lot of times at that point, security focused on perimeter security and network security. What we have now is a world where we've introduced containerized applications where you may have code running in thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of containers that may be moving between servers. Um, as we look at, at things like public cloud container services, we start to see multi-tenancy. And this creates a much more complicated security scenario where you have to now introduce new techniques and new technologies. And within the Open Infra community, we've been building technology to help um, give operators new tools to manage this kind of a, of a security environment. Um, a, a big one of those being Kata containers. Kata containers provides strong isolation, but in a very lightweight way, so that you still get all of the benefits of speed and, uh, and density from containers, but you have a stronger isolation mechanism around them that gives you better security. It also enables certain features that you might want if you're trying to pass through hardware um, up to an application. What we've also seen, though, is that with the original versions of Kata containers, we're not just wanting to isolate containers and workloads from other containers and workloads. But as we move into uh, more and more adoption of this, as we move into uh, a world where we see things like the AI uh, workloads that, that John was talking about, we have assets in our containers. We have assets on our servers that in some cases are some of the most valuable IP that businesses own. These models, uh, all of the data that, that is contained with them are extremely valuable for these businesses. And they wanna make sure that that data is private, is secure, and remains um, secret to them. And there's been a, a new movement that's been emerging over the past few years called confidential computing. And here we're not thinking about just workloads and, and tenants from each other, but we're, we're including in our threat model and in our security model, how do we make sure that even if someone has physical access to a server, that my workload, my data, is still secure and secret from them? And so we see hardware support with things like AMD SEV. Uh, we see various types of, of um, networking stacks and container stacks that wrap this up. And we have seen this support coming into Kata containers uh, with the Confidential Containers Project. Kata was started a little over five years ago, and to talk some about these container security uh, uh, implications and the progress that we've made as a community, I wanna invite up two of the first engineers of the Kata project who are gonna do a, a demo and talk about this. Help me welcome Wang Xu and Peng Tao. All right, Xu. Thank you. 
Oh, well, okay. welcome. All right, yep. go, go get that set up. Let's make sure we've got the, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're gonna do more live <laughs> demos. Yep, <laughs> thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, y'all. And I can, I can still remember the five years ago, uh, 2018 in Vancouver. And at this stage, I, um, together with Amy, to announce the 1.0 release of color containers. And today, this year, uh, we, uh, we have released the, the 3.0 version, yeah. I'm, I'm Wang Xu from the uh, Ant Group, and also I'm the, uh, I'm the co-founder co uh, co of the Kata, Kata Containers Project. And uh, yeah, uh, this is my, my team member, Peng Tao, and his, yeah, uh, he also writes the first line of the, the Kata code. Yeah, so introduce yourself. Hi hey everyone, it's a pleasure to be here to demonstrate today's demo. Yep. <laughs> and for the Kata, the, the 3.0 release, uh, we introduced the, the Rust, Rust implementation of the runtime part. Yeah, and uh, also we have a built-in hypervisor, built-in VMM for the, for the sandbox. Uh, so you can run one part in only one process. And this is the, the uh, which the improve in the in the uh, in the architecture, and also yeah, um, we have a uh, we have introduced the confidential container support. Uh, it's about the confidential computing. Yeah, from, uh, when we introduce Kata, yeah, uh, it protects the infrastructure itself from the workload if there is something uh, try to attack in the. Uh, inside the sandbox and uh, get the privilege. Uh, it cannot escape the, the sandbox. And in some, uh, in some critical workload from such as the fi financial and some, some other pri privacy, you need to protect your content from the infrastructure. I mean, if there is anything wrong in the, uh, in the infrastructure, they cannot access the, the the content of the of the of the in, inside the, the sandbox. So that's the uh, that's the confidential computing, and uh, we we have introduced a, an, a initial support for the for the confidential container called Coco. That's confidential container. Yeah, and uh, today we will do a uh, do a demo for the, for it. And uh, yeah, all right. We Are we ready to go? Yeah, got this demo. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Yes, uh, we, we will show a live demo. So this is a, a run on the, on the Ali, uh, Alibaba cloud. Yeah, it's a commodity server, commodity server with, the, uh, with the ICV support. Yeah. And uh, yeah, mm, uh, we, have, we have heard a lot of, a lot of AI things uh, in, the, in the keynote. And uh, this one is also, also AI, AI related. And we have introduced a, and uh, Llama, uh, a big, uh, the, the large model in, inside the container, yeah. So you're so gonna be running a, a, your own yeah, large yeah, language yeah. model yes. inside of a, a, a container on a server that supports SEV for the memory encryption. Uh, yes, uh, but right now we, I think we should, we still should, should wait for it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the, at the first day we launched the Kata, okay. yeah, we, said, we said the slogan, the, the secure of VM and the fast of container. Mm -hmm. uh, but today, what? Uh, yeah, it's launched in 35 min, uh, seconds. Uh, uh, not really slow, right? Yeah, because it's confidential, so it's a bit, a bit slower. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Because it's, it's a confidential container, so if we try to use the, the exec to access the, the content of the container, you can't. Uh, we have stopped this way, and also you cannot access the memory of the, of the container from outside. Um, but you can still uh, use the SSH to log in it. Yeah. Show us. Yeah. And uh, show, show the, the CPU features. Uh, yeah, you can you can you can find the ICV inside. So uh, we have already run in the in the confidential part, 
And uh, yeah, let's try to chat with it. Okay? Yeah. Apparently. Okay. With the question, we should ask it. Mm, and let's explain the, the yeah, theory of yeah. relativity. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh. Oh. <laughs> it's created by Einstein. Yeah. <laughs> so the good ex yeah. explanation of it there. <laughs> uh, so long. <laughs> <laughs> Can you ask it stop? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you finish it. Wow, uh, it stops. Yes. So uh, after it uh, stops the the relativity, and uh, yeah, we have another question for that. Um, yeah, we have asked it to. I think uh, earlier the uh, minute, minutes ago. Uh, yeah. Mark has said yeah. some. This is Mark. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is, we're writing the code right, that Mark right was the, talking about. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. Write a program without a programmer. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have become a prompt engineer. Yeah. What? Bingo. Yeah, cool. Yesterday, we, in rehearsal, we used Python. <laughs> <laughs> It knows many languages. Uh -huh. mm, yeah. Uh, we just ask, ask it to, to write the program, and uh, we cannot guarantee it can run. <laughs> 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 OK. 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 OK, enough. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew AI was so talkative? Yes. yes. You're more than me. <laughs> um, and uh, so this time we bring several kata-related kata topics here, and uh, two of them about the, the kata architecture. So um, let, the, let the, the AI tell us which one is better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first one is about the, 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 kata, the, the architecture of kata 3.0. That's from the Pengtao itself. And the second one is about <laughs> some new, uh, new feature we will introduce in Kata 4. And uh, it is. Oh, uh, uh, wait a minute. OK. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Were you, were you training this model? <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, no. You, you bet it. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, every, every time we create a, 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 new, a new container, so the last one is, uh, is destroyed. It has no chance to learn from what we try. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, probably go with the topic. Oh, what a pity! You cannot, you cannot try th this topic. This topic has already finished. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, it's 12 p.m. today. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's all. That's all. That's our uh, that's our demonstration. Yeah, you can you can you can say goodbye to it. <laughs> okay, yeah. it's creating. Yeah, yeah, it's you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's all the all the demonstration of of Kata, and yeah. uh, I think for the for the AI part, the the confidential in about the GPU in Kata is is not really uh, really right right now, uh, but we just uh, run it in the CPU, so it's a, a bit slower. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, that's all the demonstration. Yeah, well, thank you for, for demonstrating that. It's awesome to see, like I said, you know, the way that, yes. <laughs> that, uh, that the community is, is, is building new open source solutions to, uh, to take care of the new architectures. And, uh, and yes. This way? Um, Bye. There is another session tomorrow, um, as well as Thursday. To, uh, uh, where you can go learn more about the, the next um, Kata containers developments. So uh, moving from you know, the, the engineers who are writing the software and, uh, and kind of 
um, helping us see where, where we need to go with container security. I wanna actually um, move now to hearing from some operators who are running this, and, uh, and these are operators from Microsoft who are implementing um, container security solutions in the Microsoft Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, so this is really cool to have uh, Microsoft Azure represented here and coming to talk about what they're doing and also to have them participating in the open infra community. So please help me welcome from Microsoft, Amr and Michael. Hey everybody, uh, glad to be here. My name is Michael Withrow, I'm a product manager on the Azure Kubernetes service. My name is Amar Gowda, I'm principal product manager in Azure Confidential Computing. I've been part of the team for the last uh, five years. Uh, Amar and I essentially work, are working together uh, to bring all the confidential computing capabilities that exist out in the ecosystem uh, into Azure Kubernetes service. Uh, so today we're going to kind of talk to you through a couple of different options, uh, essentially walking through CATA confidential containers uh, to achieve zero trust operator deployments within Azure Kubernetes Service. All right. To start out, at Microsoft Azure, we love open source. What does that mean? Not only do we consume open source, but we actually heavily contribute to open source. So there are many initiatives across the open source community that we are heavily, uh, have a lot of developers in that heavily contribute to make uh, the open source capabilities uh, work natively within uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, obviously, open source re remains a big differentiator for organizations. Uh, there's many different communities, uh, capabilities that exist. From our perspective, the big thing that I want to call out for that's important to understand is because we have all the developers integrated into the upstream communities, we actually le natively leverage the APIs uh, that come from the open source community. We don't proxy, we don't fork any of those things off so that everybody gets the benefit of everything that we're building as well as we do. So with that, um, essentially, as we talked about, uh, this is to announce uh, CATA pods, CATA containers for pod sandboxing on AKS. Essentially, we've technically had this in public preview since February of 2023. We're working heavily towards Jing this feature set. Um, when you look at the scenarios, obviously the big thing that we're hearing from a AKS perspective, Kubernetes perspective, a lot of uh, talks about this, is how do I leverage multi-tenancy? How do I bring multi-tenancy to my environment? Typically, a lot of customers deploy a single cluster, deploy one application in there, and they're looking to make that deployment a lot more dense, a la multi-tenancy. Um, so when we look at that, obviously from an AKS perspective, not only do we have a lot of S500 customers across the globe uh, that are running on top of AKS, but a lot of Azure services also run on top of AKS as well. And the theme of what they're looking for um, comes from both of those initiatives. So if we look at the implementation uh, from a CATA perspective, obviously it starts with the Microsoft hypervisor, uh, nested VM capabilities, and then we actually integrated CATA with our cloud hypervisor capability as our virtual machine manager. Now I'll kind of turn it over to Amar to kind of talk about confidential containers. Thanks, Michael. So we did not stop here, right? So CATA gave us an amazing platform for VM level isolation. And we have offering, and Azure has been a pioneer and one of the co-founders of Confidential Computing Consortium back in 20, uh, three or four years back. So we have in invested heavily into confidential computing, and we want to build on top of it. You saw our demo from, uh, from Ali uh, just before about confidential VMs and what AMD, SCV, SNP has to provide. So we, we've been actively contributing and working with confidential containers, which is part of the CNCF incubation, going into sandboxing very soon. Right, so we want to work with the community, build with the community, and have an offering where you are empowered to run the same stack wherever you want to run. Right, so that's the strongest fundamentals we're building on top of. So some of the, some of the contributors to Kata Confidential Containers are Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, hardware providers. You have Red Hat heavily invested into this. One of the co-founders for Kata Confidential Com uh, Containers, or COCO, is how we call it. So what's, what's this looking like on AKS? So we just last month announced an uh, upcoming preview, right? This is a ready going public preview where you can run confidential containers on AKS, first class, fully supported with AMD SCV SNP, which is the next version of SCV with higher confidentiality and code integrity promises. I have, I have a slide that talks about how we, 
how we extend the conferential inferencing, model protection, as well as attested inferencing, where your data is private, but you are, you are, you are checking if this is really genuine uh, conferential computing environment. So, so we, we've been in this uh, for, for pretty long, and we have journey, and look at the comprehensive set of services that we have announced. That includes the data stack, the, just not the infra stack, but we have a whole of the container stack, as well as the services on built-off. So this is a whole ecosystem of offerings we've fully invested into how you can achieve your end-to-end -end confidentiality goals. It's just not about processing the data in a TEE. You can go to store that PAI data in a private data somewhere. Right? So this is, this is going to allow you to achieve your full end-to-end -end goals. Uh, we also have developer tools on top of this as well. So let's look at what Kata Coco has to offer and how and what tech stack we are building this on top of. So uh, first to start with, right? So it's a big Kata containers is a baseline. Kata Conferential Containers is the next layer. We run Conferential VMs as a micro virtual machines that are very ultra lightweight, highly hardened, and full attestation capabilities that run AMD. And we're going to invest into newer hardware as they become available. Uh, once, one thing you saw previously is we have Intel TDX offerings as well going in private preview. We also have NVIDIA GPU going into H100 confidential GPUs as well. So we are one of the first vendors to announce support for NVIDIA as well. Some of the, the scenarios, will, the confidential computing is cool, but can I use it for everything else? Yes. If you if you really serious about confidential uh, security and securing your code and you really you have low trust on, on, on the provider, this is a way for you to get into this. Uh, you can, you can go, go to that MS link to read more about Cocoa and AKS. So the tech stack is built on the same cloud hypervisor as a virtual machine manager. We run nested VMs. Uh, this is our start. Uh, we're obviously working in other, other, other technologies to expand into non-nested as well. Uh, this is running Microsoft hypervisor with cloud hypervisor to orchestrate all of this. So you're going to just you know, run a single uh, AKS worker node, but AKS worker node can get partitioned into tiny VMs, and each VM is a confidential VM. That's how our architecture is. We have a dedicated session tomorrow. We go into this. We show you a demo as well. I'll quickly go to that slide. So what are the goals? So we have COCO. Here are our protection goals. We will protect you, and we plan to, and our North Star goal is to protect from all of these uh, parties. Right, so you are control of your destination and the code you trust and run. And every code that is part of your TEE is fully open source and auditable. This is a big differentiator for us compared to other providers. All right, so quickly going into how, how this would look, for example, in the world of AI, right? Very relevant, model protection, you saw our demo. We're extending it even further. You could do a test at TLS. Even before you saw your responses, you're asking questions to uh, large language models, you can challenge the model as a like, prove you are running in a conferential environment and meet my security baseline. That's when your client and browser is trying to do that authentication. We call this mutually attested TLSs, and that's when you start doing inferencing. So your data is fully private from the cloud provider, and the only thing that is accessible to you is the code and the session that you have with the client. This is how we are enabling. You could, you could learn more in the upcoming session. So Please stop by. We have a demo. We have a streaming analytics using Kafka running Dapper. I'm going to show you a demo of how we're going to do that with Coco on AKS. Thank you all. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank all right. You. Thank, thank you. you. That, was, uh, that was a very quick overview of a lot of information. So make sure you get to their session where they're going to have time to dive deeper into it. And they are also doing a, uh, a demo at that, and that's going to be tomorrow morning. So uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the projects that help us secure our workloads. One of the things that we need to be thinking about is also how do we secure our projects? What should we be thinking about as open source communities and developers, uh, especially in the context of what Thierry talked about earlier this morning, where um, we really see governments around the world waking up to um, the, the the ubiquity and power that open source software communities uh, kind of wield and create through their work. And so uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a moment here to, uh, to hear um, some of the things that we can think about as architects, developers, community leaders working in open source to help make sure that we are thinking strategically and putting our projects on a good track. So to talk about that, help me welcome Ava Black.
Hello, folks. Good afternoon. Um, and now we're getting towards the end of the day. So I'll kick us off here by saying sometimes it's hard to think about things in the abstract. We've probably all been hearing a lot about SBOMs and supply chain security, but I'm going to take this back to something tangible and, uh, well, one of my favorite things, pie. Um, and I won't say in your way between going and getting some pie after this for too long. This is a, a pie that a friend of mine baked, a lovely smoked apple pie, but if it was sitting here in front of you on a table or on the stage, would you just walk up and eat some without knowing anything else about it? Probably not. If it had a list of ingredients next to it, you know a little bit more. But is that enough? Do you know, were the ingredients expired? Were they subject to a recall because of some contamination? Was the flour gluten-free? It doesn't say. Is the cook even any good? How would you know? Is the list even accurate? And ultimately, if you got sick from eating the pie, do you have any legal remedy? The answers to all these questions are supply chain questions. And this is where food safety and a lot of other regulated industries have rules that they have to follow. Cybersecurity, not so much. How does open source fit into all of this? Well, as Thierry was saying, open source is everywhere. It's in everything. It's all around us. Black Duck is a cybersecurity company. Uh, they publish a pretty good report on the security of open source projects. I think this was their eighth year doing it. Um, and in it, they point out that 96% of all software stacks that they surveyed contained open source. 91% of all stacks contained open source that hadn't been patched in more than two years. And 76% of all code that they surveyed in those stacks was, in fact, open source. So really, it is in everything all around us, from our smart light bulbs to airplanes and F-16s to gas pipelines and pacemakers and banks. The analogy here is that corporations have been selling pies without necessarily doing good quality control on the ingredients or telling, uh, you know, it's claiming it's not their fault if people get sick because eh, log for j wasn't really theirs. It was just an ingredient they sourced. And I've said for a while that open source has suffered uh, from profit-motivated insecurity. And I'll explain what I mean by this. You've seen a couple timelines today. Um, I go back to about 20. 10, roughly, when I saw the growth of this begin with financial incentives to hold back operability, observability, maintainability, and ultimately security from the open source commons, which isn't a big deal if you're buying the, the, the product from the vendor. But remember, 75% of all code in all the things all around us is open source. So if it's being deprived of security, that actually does affect all of us. And governments have noticed. Right, so the White House and the Office of the National Cyber Director put out a statement and a new strategy for the U.S.'s cybersecurity plan a few months ago that even calls out this practice directly. Now, no company would sell a pie in a supermarket without a list of ingredients, but effectively the software industry has been selling pies to the government and to con consumers without transparency, and that lack of transparency prevents consumers from acting in their own interest. Now, the White House and their strategy also calls out open source and that they are trying to uh, hold responsible those stakeholders who can solve this without burdening open source developers. Uh, you know, great innovation engine we all have built here in the past 15, 25 years. Let's keep it going. But European Union may be taking a different approach. Um, I know the Open Infra Foundation put out a commented on this, as did many other foundations, as the OSI uh, helped with some of these. I think the Eclipse Foundation's write-up has been one of the most thorough. It's unclear how this will play out in the next couple of years. Regardless, it is clear that SBOMs are here to stay. They are now part of U.S. federal procurement requirements, and the minimum bar is pretty low right now, but that bar is being raised. There are already new regulations in addition to SBOM under review in the U.S. And ingredient lists are not the end of the supply chain story for food or other regulated industries. I predict they won't be the end of it for software either. Uh, we will need to have the equivalent of food safety ratings, expiration dates, the little traceability barcode on the bottom of a can of soup that enables a recall, a federally coordinated rapid response to vulnerabilities. All of the tools for that are being investigated or invested in and built, many in open source. And that is the role 
I think foundations can play best to raise the bar for all the projects hosted in the foundation, to build security into the development lifecycle of the projects and thus the products that depend on them, to coordinate with corporate sponsors while prioritizing the needs of the individual maintainers without whom none of this goes, and to partner with other foundations to work with each other and collectively advocate to governments for the right balance of regulations and to build the right tools that benefit all of us. I don't have enough time to talk about all the awesome tools out there. This is a super, super short list of a few of my favorites, uh, and I'm going to highlight three of them for you. I think one of them even has a talk here. It was a little last minute for me, so I didn't, not sure which ones. Two standards coming out of the OpenSSF uh, that describe this space. SALSA as a standard to assess safe development practices in open source in open source. Now, it's heavily inspired by practices that were pioneered and encoded in the Open Infra and OpenStack Foundation's Infra team a decade ago. The goal here is to normalize those across all of open source. And the secure, secure supply chain consumption framework is the counter side to that. How do you consume it safely? The Omniware project I helped start last year, the goal is to, without needing any project level changes, help embed traceability throughout the entire supply chain uh, in, a, in a binary way. Again, the goal being zero effort for developers on this one. And then lastly, a little project that MITRE spun out uh, after a bunch of conversations we had to help assess the risk of a project, not just based on static analyzers or dependency checkers, but on the community's development practices. And this is kind of also similar to a scorecard project in the OpenSSF, which HipCheck takes as one of many inputs. So thanks so much. Please get involved. Raise the bar of security for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Uh, as I said, security has many facets that we need to think about when we are wanting to build it into our environments and our projects and our software. Uh, and so definitely, um, thinking about these types of policy issues and the processes that we undertake in our projects is going to be more important going forward. We have a number of sessions uh, that you can check out over the next couple of days related to security this week, and uh, if this is a topic that you want to spend more time on and contribute to in the community, please join these sessions. So that wraps it up for this segment, and uh, I am going to hand it over for some exciting super user award announcements now. All right, so there's two things that I love in this world. One is data, and one is organizations who talk about their, how they're using open source infrastructure and production. So the Super User Awards have been around since 2014 to recognize organizations who not only operate open infrastructure, but also have contributors back in the upstream community. So to crown the winner for, um, for the 2023 Super User Awards, please help me welcome Xu Wang. I'm back. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> Sorry, we had to pull him away from the demo. Yeah. Um, so yes, last year in Berlin, yeah. um, Ant Group was one of the winners of the Super User Awards. Yeah. Um, so we're excited to celebrate in person because y'all weren't able to attend last year. Yeah. So welcome. Um, but yeah, so first we're going to acknowledge all of the uh, nominees because we had so many great organizations nominated, and not just for one project. Most of them talk about how they're well leveraging and contributing to multiple open source technology communities. So the first one is an organization that supports Zool installations that run several thousands of jobs per hour, which is? Yeah. It's Ac Acme Gating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, the next one is an organization whose global compute and storage investment consists of over 400,000 OpenStack cores several petabytes of RAM, and hundreds of petabytes of replicated Ceph block and object storage. Bloomberg Engineering. <laughs> 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 
The next nominee has contributed over 40,000 lines of code to the OpenStack project, which is significant, and other communities like Linux. They have also contributed over 30 commits and 1,000 lines of code to features such as dirty limit and issue fixes. Oh, it's China Telecom and Tian Yun. The next nominee has multiple systems running Starling X in test environments on behalf of their customers in the last three years and have been actively involved in the Starling X community. And they're also our first nominee for the Starling X project. Ancora. So our next nominee is a cultural and tourism industry provider in China that has formed by integrating different public clouds and private clouds for various business sectors in a certain province. Uh, Hubei Joint Technology. Our next nominee offers documentation and tutorials on our wiki and blog for a wide range of open source technologies. You can actually find a lot of those directly on SuperUser itself, which makes them a great nominee. KeepStack Technologies. Yeah. And the next nominee, uh, their storage and computing capacity is distributed among multiple OpenStack private clouds and supported by other open source technologies like RabbitMQ and MySQL. OpenMetal. Our next nominee, we have a lot this year. <laughs> like I said, there's a lot of organizations innovating with open <laughs> infrastructure. So um, Workday has talked a lot in the um, Open Infra and OpenStack summits before about their OpenStack usage. What's really exciting is they're here this week to talk about their Zool usage and how they migrated from Jenkins. But they also leverage other open source projects like Ansible and Calico and have over 3 million cores of OpenStack in production. Uh, work day, mm -hmm. and this is not the last. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, last one, I promise. So um, this is another Zool user. So they have, um, with its modern tool chain of Zool, Ansible, and Calico, as well as some custom tooling, they, um, this is the wrong description, but I still want to <laughs> recognize them. <laughs> um, so TPG Telecom um, is actually an OpenStack user, so um, we'll still recognize their contribution to the community. Yep. All right, so yeah. this is the moment to decide who we're going to put give it to. Yeah, Ready? It's Bloomberg Engineering. Congratulations. Thank you. I think we have a special trophy. Congratulations. I don't know. <laughs> Are there any other Bloomberg folks out there? All right, come on. The, come on on stage, yeah. Congratulations. 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 Oh, there's more. Yeah, I thought so. All right, well, join me in welcoming Bloomberg to the Honorary Club of Super User Award winners. All right, so I know it's been a very long first day, so all we want from now is to have a great time with Open Infra. Are there more coming? There you go. <laughs> Come okay. on out. Oh, okay, so Thierry did say that anything became everything that open infrastructure is powering. <laughs> and we do have an OpenStack powered baby now, so yeah. congratulations to Jonathan Bryce for his new addition to his family. I got up. <laughs> it's his first keynote, yes. <laughs> All right, thanks, y'all. <laughs>